podcasts, we talk about like Russia, North Korea, Iran, China as being like the premier hackers in the world when really it's undeniably the United States. To put it in another way, you know that saying, like, if a bear if a bear comes running after you, you just have to run faster than the other person. When, when it comes to <laughs> when it comes to civilian hacking, uh, hackers are opportunistic. If you're, you're hard, you're, you're hack really sorry. You're really selling this. I think for some reason, and maybe this is just negativity bias. I'm gonna. I, I feel like I lean more towards what Damon was saying in that, like, this could be used in very dangerous means. Um, yeah, what a what a great W, Naaman. We're in a shitty world in which anything could just fall apart with a press of a button. Today we have like an interesting topic. I uh, I'm not really educated on the topic itself, so I'm. I really need you guys to help me through because uh, I'm not gonna pretend that I'm some 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 smart boy in, when it comes to hacking or something and I think that uh, sometimes it takes uh, 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 you gotta recognize where your where your flaws are right or where your limitations are so uh, this is one of those um, that being said welcome everybody welcome Elysium welcome Jay Chow Life and welcome Neymanen and uh, thank you for coming on for Lib Praxis so every week we pick a topic uh, this week's topic is uh, is picked by Jay Chow. Uh, so Jay Chow, you can do an introduction on the topic itself and then uh, basically uh, uh, give your own opinion about it as well. And then we can have the other two panelists give their opinion. So Jay Chow, go ahead. Yeah, so the reason why I picked this topic, hacking, is because of recent news of Anonymous, the hacking organization, international activists, uh, that's kind of what they call themselves, maybe on Wikipedia, uh, has been taking down government websites, uh, especially recently this, the Russian websites because of what they're doing to Ukraine. They've also been targeting companies, releasing data, personal data, emails, and all sorts of stuff, trolling places like uh, Russia Today, the uh, state-backed TV outlet of that is Russian. And so then this kind of brings up the question, uh, should we as, well, private citizens, one, be concerned about the hacking organizations out there, private hackers that could be like malicious or something, kind of like there's a, there's like a hacker phobia a little bit inside of me ever since I decided to watch the TV show uh, Mr. Robot. <laughs> and then the second thing is, well, should governments be uh, wary and, and afraid? There's kind of a, maybe this is like some pop culture thing, but private hackers are always have like the edge over government security, apparently. And um, so like, even though Russia is like regarded as, oh, the country that has the infrastructure for security, as well as cyber attacks and, and whatnot, they're still vulnerable. Uh, same thing with North Korea, Iran. Uh, Naaman is probably going to talk about uh, Stuxnet. Hope I pronounced that right. That was uh, allegedly... Yes. Yeah. I was pretty close, okay. Um, that was allegedly targeted against Iran, targeting their centrifuges, and uh, it, it went all over the place. So then there's also that fear is... When it comes to hacking, viruses, cyber attacks, is there a fear that it is going to go out of control to the point where everybody is affected? Um, so yeah, those, those are like the, the three questions. Should we as private citizens be afraid? Should governments be afraid? And is, is this something that we should actually be cheering for? Or is this something that we should be wary about altogether? Yeah. Do you want to give your statement on that? That's yeah. Fine. I'm more, probably going to be more on the side of Chinchilla in that I'm not an expert on this. This is kind of just a, a fun topic that I thought of when looking at current events with what Anonymous is doing against Russia. Um, however, I do know that there are a couple of people on this podcast that could talk about this extensively, and I'd like to listen to about it uh, from them. As I said before, I have a little bit of hacker phobia. 
uh, that my life is going to get compromised, my personal information is somewhere out there, even though I, I give it to companies either way. Um, and that, or in the bigger, the bigger fear, honestly, is that governments in which we, we kind of need them in order to uh, function as a society are in, in a way, like in my mind, so vulnerable to hacking and uh, th these private hackers that could, uh, in pop culture, with the press of a button, r ruin a, a lot of stuff. And so uh, that that is of a grave concern to me, in my opinion. So as private citizens, I think we should all be concerned about this, as a uh, country should also be concerned about this. And, uh, and yeah, we, we should all be concerned about this. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, then the next up are malware AI created by Japan. Elysium, go ahead. <laughs> True. Um, okay. Um, one thing about the narrative around hacking that I find interesting is we talk about like Russia, North Korea, Iran, China as being like the premier hackers in the world when really it's undeniably the United States. Um, Definitely, whenever this conversation comes up, like America just doesn't talk about it much. But I feel like we instigate and have the most sophisticated hacking um, that we like see globally, can like repeatedly. Um, so that's depending on how you feel about things. Um, kind of where I frame a lot of the stuff. I feel like America instigates a lot of the cyber complexity, if we can say. Um, the the principle that I can have around civilian hacking is we live because no one wants to see the world burn it's kind of like um nuclear mutually assured destruction but in the hands of private citizens so potentially infinitely worse <laughs> um, but the um, there there doesn't the, the idea of a safe system does not exist um and that's kind of the core of the problem when we come to um, interaction within the civilian and, and like um, secret government spheres, is there the idea that to be completely safe from hacking just is a fantasy? Um, even if you had a perfect system, the human component of any system is always vulnerable and very easily exploitable. Um, as we see, as like the main way to do hacking is not actually to like break through someone's system. It's to send phishing emails to employees of a system that will fuck up and give you access. Um, so I guess the general stance is um, in all these accounts, we should probably be afraid and it seems to be a big problem and we kind of rely on people not wanting to see society fall apart. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was thinking about like the, the Kid Boga streams, you know, with the social engineering, that kind of stuff. But yeah, <laughs> uh, next up, uh, let's go to Neng. Yeah, so uh, I, I was talking about a bit a bit on stream while reading some articles. I I have a very specific uh, opinion on where where this uh, where this leaves us. I, I think that as technology allows individuals to be more and more dangerous to the systems that support the society around us um we are going to be faced with not just the abuse of our privacy and our um and our rights and in, in as more and more there's more and more surveillance but the justified abuse of our rights and our uh, and our privacy meaning that if an individual can from one day to the other decide to be a threat to society then suddenly you're stuck with the conundrum of having to surveil your population having to put in extremely invasive uh, systems to to make sure that individuals don't break things. And unfortunately, just like uh, Elysium was, was uh, kind of starting to point out, uh, it is easier to break things than to build them. Uh, there is an inherent, uh, there is a permanent and inherent advantage to the attacker in any kind of uh, cybersecurity dilemma. That is just undefeatable. That is why I, I like, I understand why why Jay Chow, for example, portrayed it as uh, as individuals sometimes beating governments, but it's it's not necessarily that the individuals have better resources or more technical capabilities than the governments. It's just that they are have the attacker's advantage. You you can never, like Elysium said, fully protect a system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So yeah, that, that leaves the, the next question then. Uh, are we just gonna doomer pill ourselves then? Because we we never can protect <laughs> Yeah, us. that makes like, me more doomer pilled. That doesn't make me feel yeah, better. It, okay, yeah, so make, throw... it, make it Chow, it, it make Jay Chow somewhat happy at least. Yeah, so there, there's something I want to say though that that should reassure you. Though I I don't know how convincing it'll be, but it's the reality. When when you make a threat assessment as a in, in any sort of IT situation. Uh, what you're looking at is you you aren't just looking at covering all your bases to make you unhackable. You, first off, you're you're looking at who is going to attack you. What is your threat? Uh, the the threat assessment it has to be relative to how important your data is. If you're just a random citizen, your data is not worth like a super sophisticated government style attack like <laughs> this like uh, like a, a a a super complicated worm like stuxnet is probably not going to be planted on your devices or if it is it will probably be more by accident than because the NSA actually wants to listen into every single one of your phone calls and if they really want to listen to your phone calls they have other like simpler methods to do it anyways but um <laughs> Like, like I, uh, what I mean is that we, we as individuals, as private people who aren't involved with secret data, who aren't involved with government activities, uh, the threat vectors that we have to pay attention to are those that threaten, for example, our finances, our bank accounts, our, uh, uh, that, uh, our social media accounts. All, all those things are valuable to hackers, but they're not so valuable that they'll put, uh, that they'll put into play uh, like a uh, six-figure uh, uh, six or seven-figure uh, costing um, attack resources to compromise us. We're going to have to look for phishing emails. We're going to have to be careful about uh, downloading that weird binary off the internet and running it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I hope that reassures you. Like You're, you're probably not going to be under attack uh, by the kind of stuff where this principle of never being able to make a, a, a defensive system complete uh, actually applies. You just, for uh, or to put it another way, you know that saying, like if a bear if a bear comes running after you, you just have to run faster than the other person. But when it comes to <laughs> when it comes to civilian hacking, uh, hackers are opportunistic. If you're, you're harder you're to you're hack, really, sorry, you're really selling this. Like this is really <laughs> yeah, optimistic. Yeah. Just outrun a fucking bear. No, yeah, no, no, sure, no you don't have to outrun the bear. Yeah, just, you have to outrun the person. Guys, just don't be the richest so person in the world. Okay, just be poor yeah. enough so that hackers don't actually want to hack you. Here, uh, you're uh, like, optimistic. You don't have to run away from the bear. You just have to kneecap the guy next to you. It's okay. Exactly. No, what I mean is, uh, <laughs> as if the guy next to you is uh, is uh, less careful with their cybersecurity, they are going to be a much better target for for hackers than you are, and, and they're going <laughs> to focus their efforts on reaching the low hanging fruit because they make just as much money reaching the low hanging fruit as they would hacking you, which is your best line of protection as, as a civilian, I would say. No, name's definitely right. No one's gonna care about an individual private citizen to to spend any time on anything. Um, yeah. Listen, I don't plan on just being an ordinary individual private citizen just out there in the <laughs> masses. Okay, I'm trying to make it big out here in the real world. Okay, so mm -hmm. th this also does not reassure me as much as maybe you guys make it out to be. But I'm definitely not as afraid of myself getting hacked as much as say like governments and their infrastructure or say like electricity grids um nuclear reactors um or that that getting compromised and then affecting wider society that's probably my, my biggest fear and as you guys said this might be the reality that we have to accept doesn't really reassure me kind of just do or pills me more as what Shachella was saying is that attackers do have the advantage systems are always going to be vulnerable and so then, like, what what is the end game here? Like, we kind of just hope and hope for the best, pray that uh, that like hackers are ethical. So we can start with like the the worst part of the doomer pill is I, I in my personal anticipation, the next time there is a massive terrorist attack that like shocks the world in a nine eleven style, it is going to come from a cyber attack on core human infrastructure. Um, the, the reason that this isn't really seen is you only do that if you want to see society burn. Um, so the, the people that are motivated to attack civilian infrastructure are, are very, very few. Um, 
and and even of like some super extremist terrorist groups not very many of them are actually motivated to do that because they all have stuff that they want to defend too no one wants like the retaliation of sending everyone out of the electronic era um so it's it you, you have a very small group of people that actually want to see mass destruction um that's kind of the one hopeful principle <laughs> I mean, there's there's few of them, but wouldn't you also say that it only takes one in order to burn down society? Um, depending on how things play out, sure. Not like, like for, for example, but, uh, yeah. Stuxnet, and I read the Wikipedia article for it. I watched a couple of videos about it because that's Naaman told us to do a little bit of research, so I have a little bit of a background on it. But Stuxnet, uh, even though it was, I want to say, obviously targeted against Iran and its nuclear centrifuges was able to spread around to a number of countries, including the United States. And while it may not be activated because it, it needs like some sort of a purpose, some sort of a target, like some sort of a command or something, it, it still has, well, spread around and I want to say not to the control of the people who sent out that attack. And so, yeah. so ironically, you can think of these things very similar to like pandemic viruses. If something is causing a lot of effects, even if it like has the mechanics to spread, it's causing so much noise that everyone's going to notice it. So the things about like Stuxnet's first initial spread and why you're talking about how it became so pervasive was because it had a very small target. And so it wasn't interfering with the places that it was spreading to. So if you think about it like an organic virus, if something's doing a lot, it's going to be noticed. If something's not doing anything, not actually affecting you, it can probably spread a lot before anything happens um, or before people notice it. So uh, there, there is like um, there is danger for things to be able to spread out of control. But the more damage something is doing, the more attention it's going to draw, and the more obvious like. Um, focus on stopping its spread will come um yeah so yeah. i wanna i wanna ask like uh, uh name and then because you're a software engineer and that's uh so i wanted to ask like how likely uh the likelihood of like having a worm that spreads everywhere is this like science fiction or is this like is this really normal uh like like how because we 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 think of science fiction sometimes, we think about time travel, we think about all these things, right? Some of these things are not possible at all. Uh, so yeah, that's my general question, like how likely or the likelihood of like having worms that can exist on all the systems and that kind of stuff, is that is that even possible or uh, is that possible? I, theoretically, like, like we said earlier, uh, uh, anything's possible. And it, uh, like an attacker can always find uh, a vulnerability that, that was unknown before, like zero day, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, as for how likely it is, I think it's kind of unlikely. It's something we've seen a lot of in the 90s. Uh, you, could maybe, you could maybe kind of call like the 90s the, the sort of like golden age of uh, civilian hacking because you had... You had the people who before then were the like the freakers, the people who are um, hacking uh, phone lines to be able to call for free, uh, and and doing all sorts of stuff with the with like the, the tone signals and the phones. Um, the, there was a, a lot of cool stuff you could do you could do with it. Uh, as much as the movie Hackers is complete nonsense, they actually do the the references to freaking are actually like somewhat correct in that movie. But anyways, that that aside, uh, the. Um, in the 90s, you had a lot of stories like that of uh, of uh, random like teenagers uh, getting really into like hacker communities and uh, and wanting to prove themselves to be like the best. And and to do so, they they were developing malware with no other purpose than to do as much damage as possible, to spread as much as possible. And then we had those kinds of situations where we had like a worm appear. It infects half the world in in like a couple days and causes a bunch of problems. And then the patch comes out and it's fixed. Um, but we, we did see that happen from time to time. Nowadays, what we do see happening is extremely sophisticated government-backed, or allegedly government-backed, uh, malware being capable of that, but since it's government-developed, it has very specific, um, targets. 
uh, I, I like I suggested while looking at into Stuxnet um, uh, earlier today, I discovered out Flame, which was a, a, something very similar as well, also mm -hmm. targeting like Iranian companies. Um, a bit of a larger attack uh, surface, but still very, very strict. Like it, it limited itself to a thousand computers. Those those kinds of uh, this kind of software has has the potential to infect everything in the world, but it's not used for that. And the individuals who are hackers nowadays, who are civilians doing those kinds of activities, it seems like the culture has moved away from this sort of competition of uh, wanting to uh, like prove yourself by infecting as many computers as possible towards just outright making money, ransomware, um, yeah, true. Uh, like for stealing people's data, identity theft. Uh, all, all those activities are so lucrative that that seems to be where the, all, all of the efforts are, are concerted. And then we go back to what we were talking about earlier, where the, the, the civilian's attack threat is more like phishing emails, maybe like not up updating your OS in five years so you have some old ass vulnerability that, that someone's <laughs> going to use to hack you. Uh, stuff like that, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. I'm hearing um, all these things. So, sorry, Elysium, but... Uh, I... Go for it. Okay. I'm hearing all these things about how, okay, most civilian hacking is not what we actually fear in popular culture, but something that I was referring to before was anonymous attacking Russian websites, government websites, Russia Today, and mm -hmm. all, all that other stuff. So from the sounds of it, that seems to be a minority, but it also seems to be also very effective and also very dangerous, even in that regard. So... I'm really curious, like, what do you guys have to think about Anonymous as, like, an organization? What do they typically do? And specifically on what they're doing against Russia. Okay, before we jump on, or I really want to get to that, I'm going to do two quick things with Name Hussein, and then we'll get to that for sure. Um, one thing, the, like, the dick measuring contest between hackers now is, like, who is the biggest botnet instead of, like, who has the coolest code, because that's how you can DDoS the most people and stuff. Um, so, yeah. yeah, stuff has definitely shifted. And also, do you guys remember recently the log for um, shell vulnerability that came out? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Like as an example, there was like a a bug in a super common logging system that's been around for like years that no one had noticed that was accessible to anyone that could compromise any system that was running it. And this vulnerability came out and it was like globally patched within like a month, I feel like. Um, so like the, the good news is when, when vulnerabilities happen, the level of sharing of information and communication on a global scale is very fast. So like even if someone makes some crazy new virus that can take over the world, like um, people are going to react to it very quickly. Okay, now jump into Anonymous with um, Ukraine. This is like Never really sure. new. Um, Anonymous hasn't like done anything for like years and years. Like it's just been gone. Um, and so like the idea of civilians attacking a country to this scale, um, I th it is like a new phenomenon. So how the world reacts to it now is going to set a lot of the precedent, which is why this is actually super interesting. It is is my first thought on the the topic. By the way, like I remember the anonymous uh, it did a while back. They don't think that was that long. It, it, they uh, they went on the dark web and they got rid of all the child porn over there. That was the latest thing that I can remember with the anonymous did. But that being <laughs> said, like is anonymous. I think it's like a collective that everybody can call themselves anonymous as well, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not necessary. But yeah, for me personally, like child, when you when you ask that question, like I think it's it's just fake. It's it's just like I think anonymous, the anonymous is can, fake. No, it is fake. just it it's just these guys are. It can just say like, uh, well, I'm I could tomorrow if I'm becoming a hacker, I can just claim that I'm anonymous and then do some some weirder shit, and then it's like, how does that work? Even you know, it's like. But yeah, that's. I think I it's guess, just weird. But the general's yeah. asking for we don't have the to president get, of anonymous. Yeah, so like because anonymous is going to be anonymous and decentralized. Yeah, there's always going to be like weird claiming shit. But I think we can like reframe it as the idea of civilian hacking in relation to Russia and Ukraine, and and we don't have to like care about anonymous because we can definitely see there's a unique 
an element of a massive amount of civilian hacking going on against Russia right now. Also, like to be clear, uh, sure, Anonymous is not a well-defined group, but uh, they they do have like uh, recurring members. They 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 there there are there are groups of hackers that name themselves Anonymous that will always work together and that will have their own like community like operational structures. Uh, and other hackers can also claim to be anonymous, but they're, 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 it's not like like the anonymous nowadays is not the same people as the anonymous like two years ago, et cetera, et cetera. It may be, it might not be. Uh, you'd need to like investigate that in depth, but um, it, it's it's not like completely random either. Okay, yeah, for sure. fair enough. That being said, like, would we would we cheer on like anonymous or cheer on like private hackers? That was like a Jay Chow's question. So, because uh, like Elysium, you said like it's super interesting, but then I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I wanted to. Or... I didn't want to. I didn't want to. I was trying not to monologue, but no one else saying anything, so I'll go for it. Yeah. Okay. Um. Go ahead. Or what's the name? Do you want to say anything? I, I have something to say. I'll, I'll go after you. Okay. Um. Yeah. So like right now, they definitely have like public support, and it's gonna be um very hard to see like if that's a good thing or not, and it's gonna be very hard to tell how effective things are until retrospect. Um, because right now just a bunch of data is getting dumped. Like, um, the the biggest one to me is the Russian central bank got twenty eight gigabytes of its like emails, bank records, transactions, and stuff dumped out there, and that's gonna take journalists like years to sift through to find if there's relevant things in there because there's got to be like there, there's gonna be so much information that's gonna come out of this, but it's going to be so delayed that the um, public feeling towards this is being set in a positive light. And if that's a good or bad thing, is not going to be like justified until like five years from now, I feel like. OK, name? Uh, yeah, something similar, uh, may maybe a bit more, a, a bit less optimistic. Like, sure, they're, 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 they, they dumped a lot of data. But then it all depends on how that data is exploited. They also dumped a bunch of like sure. logins for government officials, and it's like, Cool. Yeah, like those logins can be useful somewhere down the line. Where usually, what you see when you have login dumps is that then you have people trying them out on every single other website and mm -hmm. and getting like like an escalation into the person's identity into their like cyber sphere or if if, if I can like make up bullshit words. Uh, they. But the thing is, by them by itself, that data doesn't do anything. You you need to exploit it further to get somewhere. Like, like what Helium said, in those twenty eight gigabytes, are very likely like twenty at least twenty to twenty five gigabytes of that is just normal operational, like stuff that people have to sort through and be like, oh yeah, this is not interesting, and that's going to take a lot of time and work. Mm -hmm. And probably there is interesting stuff in there. That, uh, like you said, like journalists are going to kind of like when we have the Panama leaks and stuff like that, like two years later, a journalist finally finished going through it and is like, wow, mm -hmm. uh, those politicians have been embezzling money, et cetera, et cetera. But there is so much work that still needs to be done. Uh, it's like right now it has zero effect, right? Like strictly right now, nothing that they have done has accomplished anything well. of value. It, it's the further it, it's I, I'm being a bit harsh of course the it has leaks, value the because there we is, can agree on that yeah. but they, they've been doing a bunch of wiping too that yeah definitely disruptive yeah. which uh, which is another thing though because something that's been a real, reality for a couple of years I, I talked about ransomware earlier uh, we we clearly know that um, ransomware groups a, a lot of them uh, are civilian but a lot of them are government adjacent <laughs> I, I was just reading an article right now about uh, a Russian and Eastern European um, uh, ransomware group, for example, that clear, they're clearly like civilian hackers, but also they, they have been doing missions of, that are in Russian interests. They, they specifically target, for example, U.S. hospitals for ransom. They also have, uh, there was a leak, uh, so someone hacked their emails, and, and there, there's a leak showing that they, they were ordered by an unknown entity to um, collect uh, collect data and compromise a uh, Bellingcat journalist looking into Alexei Navalny's poisoning. So clearly, there, what we are seeing is that there are ties between the government looks looks at those ha hacker groups and sees them as tools that they can then exploit with plausible deniability. 
because mm -hmm. you know they're just civilians like oh oh wow that yeah that's terrible they hacked your hospitals damn that sucks we're gonna yeah let's let's help you with that that buddy uh, it's very easy to, to deny any any involvement a lot of this internet stuff is is like going by proxy right the same with yeah. like the the virtual propaganda that's like basically like funded for a hundred percent by but it's a private entity so it's not the government guys so yeah but uh check out wait what hello What's yeah up? does that answer answer your question uh that you asked well yeah i mean like it i i get the answers from elysium and Naaman and uh it's good insight it's good insight this kind of does uh, what 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 Elysium said was a bit more positive. Naaman was a bit more pessimistic, and I think for some reason, and maybe this is just negativity bias. I'm gonna. I, I feel like I lean more towards what Naaman was saying in that like this could be used in very dangerous means. Um, yeah, what a what a great W, Naaman. We're in a shitty world <laughs> in which anything could just fall apart with a press of a button. Yeah, fist pump in the air. Go for it. So, yeah. Uh, it, yeah, that also doesn't make me feel better. Like, like Anonymous is, um, they, they proclaim to be, like, for good, ethical, and whatnot. And I, I, I can't say <laughs> as, as much as, like, confidence, with much confidence, whether that's true. Uh, but what I also know is that if Anonymous exists, and they're capable of doing X, Y, and Z then there's a good chance that another group with different intentions, different motivations, and maybe not as much of a, a strong moral framework also exists to do some other bad shit. Uh, this makes me believe that technology was a mistake. Uh, we talked about social media before. <laughs> uh, yeah. What, and what, 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 what a piece <laughs> of shit. Okay. And okay, yeah, we have to go back. All right. We have to return to Monk. Okay. I don't, I don't think we should frame Anonymous as being particularly moral. I think we can say they have causes, and they support those causes. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't go out there and champion Anonymous as like a good moral actor. Um, I think that's why I say they can... proclaim themselves to be. Okay. Yeah, okay. I, I can also assume that those guys can be Anonymous by day and just be like random black uh, hacker, uh, black hat hacker by night. Right? <laughs> yeah. So it. Yeah. it so that that can be i'm anonymous so, so oh you are we all are no but uh uh elysium you wanted to say something go ahead yeah i'm super happy that name brought up panama papers and stuff um because another complication on top of like when you dump information people have to sift through it for years and then there is even another delayed element on top of that is people have to care to do something about it or more specifically governments um and and like one of the most disheartening things about like the Panama paper releases is we've gotten a ton of amazing information and insights that the world would not have without them. And collectively, all the governments of the world have been like, yeah, no. So like there there definitely is like a lot of delayed elements to things. Yeah, but that is also that you need to know that the that the data is legit, right? That's also like a concern that it's not altered or whatever. Yeah. Right. So yeah. I I remember also like uh, when it comes to the Dutch, we we do like a lot of like uh, with the cell phones, we do like massive amounts of cell phone taps, and then um, afterwards when some terrorist attack or something occurred, then it was like well we already knew this if we had actually looked into the data. So they did cell phone tap that dude, but they didn't use that data, and the the same thing goes with like the British cops. That I know of that they they have like a that they hold they tap a whole neighborhood if they think there's like terrorist like activity then they have all this data but the issue there is that you still gotta refine that data right so yeah I I'm not quite sure what you guys think about that but um, I I will give it back to the name so yeah yeah that is something that China has been working a lot on because uh, as we know all know that that China is one of the biggest surveillance states in the world. And um, and they have recognized that issue that the they they have too much data to sort through. Uh, I I actually when I was in China, one of the most surprising things considering the level of surveillance um, that you you live under there, drug dealers use WeChat Pay to like collect <laughs> their money. That's that's the level of no fucks given. They how, how do you know that? 
<laughs> Just kidding. Friends, anonymous sources. Okay. Uh, um, no, but that, that's fascinating to me because you're looking at an app, an app that's like owned by the Chinese government that uh, that has a clear like a f open book auditing uh, like uh, services for the uh, for the Chinese police and the Chinese services. Nothing you do on on WeChat is private at all, and it, it's just it's 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 a billion people. How are you going to find that needle in the haystack? So what China has been doing, and which which probably is going to be the future of surveillance technology, is neural networks. Uh, they've been investing very very heavily in in AI driven uh, solutions for for sorting through the data. Uh, for example, for their camera system, they've been working on um, on facial rec on the extensive facial recognition, being able to track someone's itinerary from point A to point B, like having a system where you just like plug in a photo, it goes through a, a date, it goes through the footage of that day, and it'll tell you, okay, that person went from here to here, uh, then to here to here, it like, it like splice all the video together so you can see what they were doing for a day. Uh, stuff like that is, uh, is, I think, what they're working towards. I don't know how close they are to that because I mean, it's China. It's hard to sift what's propaganda, what what's uh, what's not. Uh, their claims are that they're they like already have that technology. I, it, it's hard it's hard to really tell what what the actual status is of it. But uh, no, humans are never going to be able to sift through all that data. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's impossible. Yeah. So something that kind of informs me a little bit what you just said, kind of a hint is when I think about the NSA and how people say uh, that our government, uh, they're spying on us and they're tapping your phones, they're tapping your webcams. Hi, U.S. government. <laughs> you can see me. Uh, but then I think about, well, the, the, what they actually have to do is they have to search for you particularly, if I'm not mistaken. And so they, like, they kind of have a system in which they really could I guess, uh, surveil everybody at once, but they don't have, like, the logistical manpower in order to do that. Kind of like what you guys were saying about, hey, there's so much data, uh, it, it's gonna have to take years in order to sift through all of it. Um, which makes me kind of less wary about, like, the government surveilling me, <laughs> because, like, what are the chances that an NSA agent is actually looking at my webcam right now? Well, it's like uh, everybody has like one FBI agent uh, assigned to them. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think, uh, so um, we're getting a little tangential, but I think this does bring up two very explicit dangers to me. Um, one is that yeah, this all is going to be automated, and so how that automated system works, functions, like what it what its goals are and stuff, uh, and how it processes like people's information is like very important to what the world is going to look like. Um, so that's like pretty crazy. Um, but like to what you're saying, Jay Chow, um, the the ability to store all of your past actions and then go, hey, this person's now a target, and be able to look back at everything you've done that we've gathered, I think is the bigger concern when it comes to American privacy or legality. Um, yeah. So just because like everything someone does is being stored and not actively looked at doesn't mean that they can't go back and look that that at some point is it is it even possible to store all the data if you wanna... yes yeah um one of the worst reports that is continuously held true um and this is like 10 years ago now is that the government was increasing its storage by orders of magnitude every year um and there is a lot of data there but if that's like data you want to store, you can. So when it comes to the US, uh, it, it like what are the rules around like storing data? Because I, I thought it was like uh, they can keep like data around for like three years or something. I don't know. In the US, it's pretty long, but uh, or is that would you guys know? I don't say. I don't oh. think they have any limitations, really. Yeah, the, the problem with this, too, is this is already in a legally, like, unspecified or illegal area. So the idea that there are, like, some limits, because especially the workaround for a lot of stuff is, like, oh, we're just storing the metadata indefinitely, which is, like, enough to have the same level of information or insight on a person in the most cases. One thing I would like to add, though, uh, as well, as far as the... Um... As far as the storage of data or like what you're bringing up, being able to 
uh, like you, maybe you do something suspicious and then they look into your past. Um, this is something people often misunderstand when it comes to privacy, uh, which is very, like, very annoying as, as someone who's involved with computers to, to have to explain every single time. Like, yes, uh, if, as long as you don't commit a crime in theory, you have nothing to hide. You, you, you shouldn't care um, in theory. Like, there's this argument, you shouldn't care about your privacy that much. But the problem is that the, the government has shown time and time again that it can and will misconstrue facts and in fact can very, very easily prosecute you off of circumstantial data and ruin your life for things that you're, even though you're completely innocent. It, it can be as, as simple as uh, like a murder or robbery investigation and oh, your, geolo your like, phone geolocalization shows that you were near the incident. And they don't have any other suspects. No one else uh, appears on cameras, et cetera, et cetera. And suddenly, you're the prime suspect. Mm -hmm. And it, it, suddenly, like the the burden of proof, the whole in the whole justice system is working against you because now you have to prove your innocence, uh, which is not how it's supposed to work. Uh, th th those are things that lawyers warn people uh, about, and th th those are very, very big dangers to to our freedoms. Uh, honestly, yeah. yeah. So in the go ahead, Joe. Yeah, so this kind of reminds me of what Elysium brought up before in that he, uh, he believes in the future uh, governments are just going to turn into surveillance states in order to uh, accommodate for the security risks of ever-increasing hacking capabilities. And if this is the case, then are the privileges that we have before been, well, privileged to and are privileged to now, freedom of speech... Um, not getting surveilled on, we have um, innocent until proven guilty, you, you can't just uh, come into my home and uh, investigate, I, I'm forgetting what that's called, Lamau. Um, it, it feels as though probable cause stuff, yeah. Probable cause, yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, you have to have a warrant, okay? Can't just, yes, get, get something from the judge, um, can't just, like, spy on me. It feels as though those rights and liberties are just in the in the future. If Elysium is true, it's gonna well go away, and uh, this is probably of like grave concern to us liberals. The praxis Lamau, uh, but the the upside is that well, this is what we have to do because of increasing technology, and we have to uh, secure ourselves. Even if it at, okay, it name is at one the of the police of, state, not me. Of, just, of just to clarify. Privacy. Oh, it was Naven. Yeah, it was yeah. me talking about the the increased surveillance. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I I personally think that what Dame is saying like the pressure on the rights. Uh, yeah, I, we can definitely see that happening already. Like, uh, I know an exact case where they basically pinpointed somebody, and uh, because of the fact that his history was uh, being in. Um, in, uh, 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 he was breaking in into houses, uh, so he was already arrested for that in the past. And then they saw like the location and saw his mobile phone, so he they could like geo pinpoint him. And then it was like uh, they weren't like making his uh, he wasn't like the suspect or something, but they invited him on the police station to talk about something, you know. And then they tried to. <laughs> To, to get him to like actually uh, uh, confess something that they didn't have any proof for whatsoever. That being said, like I don't think that the rights are going to uh, are going to disappear, but I'm I'm definitely seeing like some some uh, yeah, there is more leverage from the government to actually like uh, do stuff, right? So uh, the, yeah. Yeah, that's concerning. Oh, just, just to balance things out, to be fair, uh, as much as I've been a bit doomer uh, about, about like, uh, the future of our rights, uh, this whole talk, we have seen pushback. We have seen, um, e even though it's implement there are problems with its implementation, um, the, like, the GDPR effort in, <laughs> in, in Europe has been a sign that it's possible to pass laws that further the cause of uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the opposing cause of, pri of privacy and control over our data. Uh, as opposed to just relinquishing it all to to governments, etc. So, there that that can also be a uh, that can also happen. Mm -hmm. I'm a big yeah privacy fan. Um, I think Jay Chow is bringing up like the I think they were references twice now. Um, the the Patriot Act dilemma, the post 
9-11 dilemma of security versus privacy. Um, and in general, I feel like we should fall on the privacy end of things. Yeah, but that being said, like we have all these new tools uh, as like private citizens, right? Uh, shouldn't ha the government have tools as well? So I, I don't think the government's lacking in any of its tools to um, investigate cyber crimes for the most part that are domestic for sure. Um, I, I guess I haven't seen anything where if an investigation into a domestic crime um, wanted to happen that it couldn't. I, I guess I could be wrong there. There, yeah, I was gonna say there. There is one area that is uh, that is contentious. It's encryption. Uh, if, if if you guys don't know, until the I think it was until ninety four or ninety five. I don't remember the exact year it got repealed. The U.S. considered encryption to actually be a military technology. As such, if you are, um, it, it was illegal, for example, to carry an encryption algorithm over uh, over outside of the U.S. or uh, notably, one one of the main re biggest researchers in the in the eighties of um, of encryption and developer of algorithms uh, saw himself, for example, have problems going on vacation outside of the U.S. because in his brain he contained military technology. Um, <laughs> but like that, that's funny. But the reality is, what we're seeing nowadays when we have tr uh, true encryption, because also what followed uh, that, um, just to illustrate this whole situation. Uh, the, the NSA released, um, supposedly worked on an encryption algorithm that they then released to the public, but that was closed source. Um, and this, it, it turned out that this encryption algorithm that they released had a backdoor in it. It allowed the NSA to decrypt anything encrypted with it. They, they lost all credibility with the cybersecurity community over that. <laughs> um, following that, the, the cybersecurity community in general has very strict principles of what constitutes good encryption. It needs to be open source which allows it to be audited and and the, the auditing will allow us to determine whether it's uh, uh vulnerable to common attack vectors etc cetera, etc cetera, uh and allows you to compile it yourself in a, in a safe manner so that you know that the code you're running is exactly the code you audited yeah but speaking of encryption um, and how like that could be used in order to protect our data from vulnerabilities um my assumption is that um uh, as a layman talking about this is when you encrypt something you're basically saying in order to access this you have to have a code and this code could be really 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 long and uh depending on the your like computer or whatnot it might take like a couple million years in order to get that code um in order to get the data which kind of also raises the the prospects of well criminals also using encryption to their advantage so that the government or uh, police, F FBI, whatnot, is not able to uh, as effectively crack down on their cases. Yeah, that's exactly what I was getting at. Uh, what we've seen, for example, is that the U.S. government has time and time again asked uh, Apple to uh, uh, open up the encryption on the uh, on uh, the iMessage system. Uh, Telegram and Signal have been uh, under constant pressure from governments all across the world, Australia, UK, uh, some other governments uh, to open up their end-to-end -end encryption to allow them to well monitor the the messaging activities on those on those apps, and we know we know that those apps are used by terrorist groups, by criminal organizations, because they have this reliable end-to-end -end encryption. That means that even the companies themselves, um, even if they monitor everything going through the server itself, the, all the data going through the server is already encrypted. They have no access to whatever the users are are sending to each other. Um, so we have kind of this, but the flip side of this is when when you go the like old school NSA approach of uh, of backdoors and not allowing encryption. Some countries don't allow encryption past a certain key length, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, you also open up your companies, for example, to industrial espionage to their own encrypted communications being decrypted by a bad actor or by a foreign government's uh, bad uh, like uh, actors uh, acting in the foreign government's interests, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it's not as clear cut. Like the terrorists will use the, the good encryption, but so will the companies whose secrets you want to be remain protected. So will the legitimate citizens whose secrets want, you want to be protected. Uh, it, the same encryption protects our banking data and, uh, and our passwords when we, when we uh, authenticate online, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, 
like right now the consensus in the security community is that we need to keep encryption alive that it is not only a guarantor of our privacy and our rights but also uh it, if we if we allow governments to break our right to encryption we end up vulnerable to any any bad actor whether it was a, a civilian or a governmental bad actor mm -hmm. governments like, also like the have United access States... to subpoena in these companies they're not they're not like helpless but sorry keep going okay so yeah okay Gov united states could subpoena and it, they could get the information that way sure without having to need oh, a back door no, you're not going to get like, a, the chat problem. logs, but you can get information about who's in these groups, where mm -hmm. is the location and stuff. Like you, you can get the surrounding information. Like you're not, you're oh, not, like you're metadata. Not yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah just to be clear, end-to-end -end encryption means like the, none of that is accessible. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. So something that you said earlier, Naaman, about like okay, if the government asks for a backdoor to companies, then that leaves those companies vulnerable to other actors like going through that like that access as well so just the yeah. existence of a backdoor makes it vulnerable not just to well the government but anybody else who could get to that backdoor yeah so to put it in another way like we, we talked about the attacker advantage right it's it's so so hard to keep a system secure imagine now that you you like imagine it like a house you you make sure your house has an alarm has locked doors, uh, you, you put like several locks, you reinforce your doors, et cetera, et cetera. But then someone tells you, yeah, you know what? Uh, I need you to leave the window open. And it's like, sure, someone passing in front of the house, someone trying out the front door, they'll see it's like well protected. But then if they know that the window is like unlocked, then they can open it. And then you you're no longer have uh, actual security, you only have obfuscation of an access point. The sh and sure, the access point will be obfuscated. Like the, it will be maybe a secret code that only the NSA knows. But what if the NSA gets compromised? Like, wh what if, uh, what if they leak the code, or what if someone discovers it by accident? There, there are like a, a million different ways where this can go terribly, terribly wrong. Uh, phishing email. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Elysium. Um, I mean, I'd like to bring it back more towards about Russia, Ukraine, if that's cool with you guys. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, because I do think we are witnessing something more like a a new phenomenon in how robust the civilian versus civilian, or more like um civilian versus industrial side of Russia is right now. Um, there have been like multiple Russian companies that have had their um computers hacked, information leaked, um ransomware put on them, um. So like the the amount it's it's going to be interesting to see in retrospect the amount of like industrial um cost or or there's another word I'm looking for but I can't think of it that this causes and it like if that's significant or what the russian reaction to it will be um because so far what I've seen from the american side is to just like not talk about it yet and I don't see russia bringing it up very much either um, but I think it's going to be something that comes up a lot afterwards. Um, does that make any sense, or what do you guys think? Okay. Yeah, it, it is kind of startling yeah. that like I haven't really been seeing a lot of news regarding like, hey, anonymous is doing this. This is kind of like messed up, or uh, or this kind of implies all the vulnerabilities. They kind of just report, oh, anonymous does this, and this is like really good because Russia Today gets fucked, and then everybody cheers, right? So it, it, it is kind of concerning and um, that like maybe as like a country, both government news as well as public opinion, we've kind of just been chilling with what what is like the, the highs of going on, of what's going on right now. Uh, but I'm just thinking about, well, what does this imply? Oh, no, this is like this is a really bad future the way that I'm thinking about it, at least. Um, if it escalates, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it, it, it is really concerning. I, I really do hope that this is a conversation that happens more so in the future. Um, I, I, I'm also just concerned that public opinion has kind of already poisoned the well of, well, Anonymous was doing something good because it was against Russia, so let's let's have them do, do more things, right? Um, that, that could also have a, a lasting effect. Um, 
Now, when it does come to, I guess, what is going to be the responses from governments, in which I do think there is going to be one, at least uh, when Iran got affected by Stuxnet back then, uh, it, it came out that Iran like really invested into uh, their like cybersecurity. Like they apparently had the the largest team or like the most sophisticated something like the number two in the world, probably behind Russia, um, in order to like prevent other other attacks in which allegedly they came out saying that, yeah, there was a similar attack in like, what, 2018, and they say that they were able to stop it. I have no idea if that's true or not. Uh, but this kind of makes me think of the security dilemma in that like, yeah, governments could use attacks on t to each other and if the idea is that oh we we have an edge against them and we're going to coerce them and we have pressure over them so then they could do what they want which is us like trying to shut down their nuclear program stopping their centrifuges instead their reaction is going to be no we're we're not going to give in to the bullying uh we're not going to make ourselves vulnerable uh we're we're actually going to invest into our own cybersecurity and when they invest into their cybersecurity what that also means is they have increased their capabilities of doing attacks from themselves. I don't know if that's the same thing or not, in that, like, if you have good defense, it also implies that you have good offensive capabilities. I don't know if that's true in the cyber world. Um, um, it is. I don't think... I don't know if I'd agree with that. <laughs> well, it doesn't matter. Sorry, keep going, Nim. Well, Naaman has... No, I, I, I was like... just trying to confirm. It, it, it is true. It is true. But sorry, go ahead. Wait, but so then... Okay, this is a good debate. Elysium says it's not true, but you say it is true. Fight, fight, yeah. fight. Yeah, or what do you mean by that, name? Okay. Uh, look, if, if you're a cybersecurity researcher and you're, you're, you're like exploring attack vectors, you have to be able to play the red team. You have to be able to play the attacker. And to play the attacker, you have to know the techniques, the attack vectors. Uh, you have to know the tools. You have to be a hacker. If you're, if you're a cybersecurity researcher who is not a competent hacker, you're a bad cybersecurity researcher. There, there is like no two ways about it. Uh, obviously, okay, sure. the 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 daily skill sets are maybe going to be a bit different. You're going to be more into a analysis, uh, uh, post attack analysis, and more into like theory crafting, like potential attacks, etc. Uh, attack vectors against yourself. But you need to have the full skill set of a competent hacker. Sure. Or I I I guess I mean I definitely agree with that. I think the the difference that we're thinking about is like defending against attack vectors is going to be very differently different than like making ways to attack those things. Um, yeah, like, like the, sol the solutions vector. you create yeah. are different, cool. but the skills involved are the same. So sure. some someone who is involved in defense can flip around and and uh, and become a competent attacker. For sure. Um, I think the 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 conversation around this highlights that there aren't like any real international rules around hacking and i say real there because we make like some um but literally no one follows them um the most like competent or sophisticated international rules around hacking that i know of have to do with intellectual property um and that's primarily because that's what um you know, developed nations are going to care about. They're going to care about their companies getting their data stolen and defending against that in an international stage. And no one wants to have, in my opinion, any rules around hacking yet. And the ones that we have made and semi-agreed to with the United States, there was like one cybersecurity conference or something that got agreed to by a bunch of um, Western nations and no one else. No one actually follows them. Um, so, so there's there's a couple things I would like to add to that. Um, the, this uh, the um, a, a NATO spokesperson. There there was like a NATO conference in the first week of the war. Uh, they have uh, a NATO spokesperson. Uh, I forgot their name. Uh, c uh, confirmed that um, NATO is willing to consider cyber attacks as a trigger for Article Five, which oh, I found boy. as a fascinating statement because there is no clear definition of what uh, a cyber attack is. So. To me, it's an extremely weak statement. Uh, that's, to, I, I, that's I think, scary. yeah, yeah, I think the power of Article Five is deterrence. And if your adversaries don't even know what what can or can't uh, trigger Article Five, then it's not a deterrence. Actually, 
Um, and the second big problem is, uh, we've talked about it earlier, there's always plausible deniability in, in cyber warfare. It, it's so, so easy to put into place. Uh, it's so, so hard to find decisive proof of, of actual governmental um, incrimination that I, I, don't, I don't know how feasible uh, um, like an, 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 a rule of law is uh, when it comes to the question. And finally, the biggest, uh, also one of the biggest problems, and this is something allegedly um, Obama, Obama's administration was, bring, uh, was regularly bringing up when Obama continued the Stuxnet project um, he inherited from, from George Bush, was uh, that this is going to make them hypocrites. I mean, this is an escalation, uh, not hypocrites, but this is an escalation. The, the U.S. Has set, uh, was set a precedent for cyber warfare mm -hmm. that now is going to be the standard for all other countries. Why, why should Russian hacking groups not consider ransomware against U.S. hospitals when, uh, when the U.S. has like this really sophisticated attack that can, et cetera, et cetera. Like now, now everyone, it basically opened Pandora's box in, in a certain sense. And uh, for sure, like, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a problem. And and to build on that, when um, Jay Chow was talking about Ukraine building up its cyber defense and stuff, when you when you send a virus to infect someone's machines, they essentially have a copy of that virus. At the end of the day, you don't like um, you don't get to to take it back. You've put the attack vectors that you know, the ways to circumvent security systems the way that you know into that virus, and they can figure that out. Um, so in, in addition to letting someone know that they need more cybersecurity, you've given them something to analyze, to learn how to attack you back in a similar fashion. So if you would do a very complex attack at someone, the complexity of their attacks back at you is going to increase as they study your attack and learn from it. Um, and in retrospect, that's one of the things that people have talked about a lot with, um, Iranian hacking is we've probably provided a bunch of um, information and complexity to future Iranian attacks that they could be taking more advantage of. When we've seen a little bit of it, I think they attacked um, Saudi Arabia in a similar fashion to um, some of the stuff that we used against them by repurposing it and, and um, attacking the Saudi oil companies and wiping a bunch of their information. I, I can't remember the year off the top of my head, but I could look it up real quick. Okay. Yeah. yeah I... Go ahead. Oh. Uh, I was just going to add, like, uh, th there, there is a caveat to that, is that um, vulnerab vulnerabilities are the most powerful when they're only known by a single person. Uh, that, that, that's what we, oh. like, we call zero days. And so, for example, Stuxnet had the four different zero days that were collected by the authors of the, of the worm. Um, probably, honestly, the, the um, I, I, that's a tangent. I'll, go, I'll go get to that later. Um, th those, uh, those vulnerabilities, once they're used, uh, and analyzed by security researchers across the world, they're going to be patched. So uh, suddenly, uh, you can continue using those vulnerabilities. Like Lucian said, the, the Iranians, uh, at the very least, they can learn from the, how their worm is structured, how, how it was developed, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a lot to learn from that. There's no denying that. That'll, that'll make them much better hackers. Uh, but the specific vulnerabilities used, they'll only be able to use them against unpatched targets, targets who have not uh, been protected against them once they become widely known. So that obviously limits a bit the, the reuse of, uh, of attacks. Mm -hmm. um, this was in 2012 when they attacked Saudi Arabia. Um, okay. uh, another element to this though is, especially when we talk about infrastructure, these machines are often the like lowest grade complexity machines, the oldest operating stuff out there. Um, that aren't going to be getting any updates to them once they're out. So in terms of defending the stuff that we care most about, it's typically probably like some of the most vulnerable hardware there is. Um, and really relies on the principle of no one wants to, to lose all of their civilian infrastructure. I, to, be, to be clear, it's, it's, it's not like the industrial controllers are connected to the internet. What you're patching in that situation is you're patching the computer that they use to control the industrial like controlling hardware. Uh, obviously, the like like you said, the industrial controlling hardware that's going to be an old ass system that's just bought because it's reliable and no one wants to change what's what isn't broke and it has no security uh, like uh, no security at all built into it. Uh, but where you do have a layer of security is in how you control how you program 
the industrial controller itself. The, the computer that you connect to it, that's the one you need to keep patched, you need to keep up to date, you need to keep it air gapped, you need to keep uh, watch uh, who has physical access to it. Um, because that's another big principle in security. Anyone who has physical access to your device, you have to assume that they've been able to compromise the device. Their, their physical access is always leads to compromise, but that's new here or there. Or there. Uh, oh yeah, speaking of zero days, there's something I wanted to mention as well. Um, when it comes to contact between the government and civilian interests, uh, something that um, companies are very suspected of doing, um, like we talked about backdoors earlier, they're suspected of selling zero days to government agencies to allow them to develop those extremely sophisticated attacks. Um, there are articles suspecting um, uh, suspecting Apple of, for example, having collaborated with the Chinese government in in um, in not patching a vulnerability over several years that allowed them to um, to basically identify Uyghur uh, iPhone users. Uh, there there are some articles about that. Um, That's fucking crazy. So, Apple. yeah. I look the the. Do you want to know the funny thing? I uh, I was talking about Apple not willing to open iMessage encryption to the U.S. government, and uh, there are very good arguments for that. Apple has opened iCloud encryption in China. If you if you're using uh, iCloud in China, the Chinese government has access to your iCloud, even though in the rest of the world it's properly encrypted. Okay. Yeah. China has been able to yeah. leverage its uh, the fact that it can close its market off to company to basically strong arm uh, those companies into compromising their their security um, solutions. China is a big market. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's yeah, definitely so, a problem. Sorry. So it's definitely a problem. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would definitely see that as a problem. Um, yeah, I will. I was thinking about a couple of things. Like I, I was thinking about like the uh, the thing that you mentioned as well, named the the possible like deniability. Like I don't think that we can outsource uh, our nukes and then uh, give them to a private company and shoot them up in the air. And then, uh, but but the the difference there is like obviously like with with like uh, uh, like these hacks or. It's the attack just overall was just way different than how to even approach that. We don't really know. So the person who says like that NATO five should be enacted when there is like a, a cyber attack. I think that's kind of silly because yeah, it's like, I don't, I don't necessarily think that we should like say that in the first place, uh, should that be even the case? Um, I don't know because then can still like imagine having an American company doing something to like the Chinese government or something. Are are we at war now or how does that work, right? Like I think <laughs> I think I think this yeah, this it's just an overall like interesting question. But uh so yeah, but how should we deal as like governments around the world with like cyber attacks in general? Um, that would be my question, and maybe you guys could give like a prescription, something that we can actually do, as like a, or some law or some well, idea that we should. Uh, we should I mean, protect. I guess the 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 problem is to say how should we deal with it is like the question. The current thing is there are no actual rules. It is up to everyone to interpret how they want because there's no international standard, and so that yeah, has okay. to be made in some way. And now you're you're god emperor of the world. So go time. ahead. So go ahead. What 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 would be solutions? Um, I think the only thing that super makes sense to me is you have to build off of the small precedent that we have now. Of um, there is always plausible deniability, but you can sometimes show where an attack originated from, and domestic security agencies or governments have to be responsible for taking care of hacks that happen or that originate from within their nation. Um, as this small precedent that we currently have of if a hack happens, you go to that nation and you say, hey, this hack happened from here and it's up to that country's law enforcement to deal with it. Um, and so that has to be expanded out into a bigger precedent that has consequences when governments don't um, prosecute hacks within their country. Okay, interesting. And name? 
Um, I would like to add another problem with plausible deniability. It's uh, that we haven't mentioned yet. It's very, very easy to make a cyber false flag attack. Uh, it, you, could, you could release a worm and, hey, you, you compile it with a Russian compiler. We add in some, throw in some Russian language into the, into the code. And suddenly it looks like it was developed by Russian hackers. And you, you can play, and that will play, like, if you release it now, while with the current situation, that will, you know, that will play into the whole, like, uh, um, anti-Russian sentiment, et cetera, et cetera. And maybe you can obfuscate the real source of the attack. Um, I, I think that, that that's important to remember because uh, e even, even with, like, investi investigating cyber attacks, um, like, other than worms, uh, IPs can like a server might be located in in the US or in Russia or in Iran or anywhere else but the server itself unless you get physical access to it unless you can actually consult the um, the connections it's made and the the software it's running uh either the server is the real endpoint or maybe it's just a proxy and maybe the real server is located in I don't know South Korea and um and so like once again it those investigations you need to be handled very carefully. Um, as for a general like rule of law perspective, I do agree with the Elysium statement that we should have a standard where when a cyber attack occurs, uh, you can go to the government where you suspect the cyber attack to have occurred and expect them to run a good faith investigation into the into the issue and say like you track down the connection to a server in the country and they can maybe seize the server in the in the data center. Uh, investigate it and either either the attack did originate from the country or it's connected to another server and the investigation continues but that imp but that only works with good faith actors which we now know russia is not uh <laughs> when it comes to bad faith actors i think there is just no recourse uh, honestly uh, the only recourse is to strengthen the cybersecurity of your nation's companies of your nation's infrastructure uh which is extremely hard like once again there's the attacker's advantage but that's all you can do and that's what we should do okay and then ciao wow it, it just feels like there are no good solutions to this even if i become god emperor like the solution would be to we're all one country so we're all one people so we don't attack each other in the first place because we're <laughs> one big happy family peace and love am i right or am i right um <laughs> to talk about like uh, what Elysium solution is, which is, um, if it actually works, that would be pretty ideal. If our countries actually did follow up on, well, hey, uh, there was a cyber attack. Seems like it originated from your country. Can you deal with it? And they would be like, no, it didn't come from us. It's fake news. They're lying. You're lying. As uh, I'm pretty sure that's what <laughs> Russia has done a couple of times, uh, as, as well as other countries as well. So uh, that's a flawed system in which... Um, not, not a good solution. Nothing against you, Elysium, but this is just a tough problem in the first place. And then mm -hmm. uh, what, what Naaman said, which I'm forgetting off the top of my head, uh, but I also think there are problems as well. Naaman, can you, can you shortly explain well, what was your solution? Uh, I, I, I said, uh, uh, like, once you're dealing with bad faith actors, the only solution is to strengthen the security in your country. Okay, uh, yeah. Create okay. Standards, Got it. standards for cybersecurity. Uh, industry like industry standards there there are still like the problem is there is still low hanging fruit in key companies and key infrastructures companies that don't properly implement uh correct uh, protocols correct uh disclosure correct auditing uh those are all things that can improve an entire company's uh, safety against those attacks got it so that there's also a problem in that too is that like even if like say two private hackers are going to go for the low hanging fruit obviously so they're probably not going to try to deal with um companies in like the united states even though they actually might be capable of doing it it's just going to be a bit harder but if you're russia and all of a sudden you see united states beefing up its defense then what russia is probably going to do is try to beef up its own offense what i'm trying to get at is that sort of prescription risks leading to escalation in that uh batman quote um we, we start wearing Kevlar and they start wearing body armor. Uh, we, we start carrying we start carrying rifles and all of a sudden they have like armored tanks. Um, you, you guys know about that, but yeah, like that, that's the problem of, of escalation, uh, which I fear. Um, 
there there this is this also isn't a perfect solution but just something to think about and which is what russia alleges what they're doing is creating like their own decentralized internet and i don't know much about the subject to say if whether that's like a good solution or a bad solution what i do know is that like that it's going to get be it's going to not interact with the rest of the internet and um and that's pretty bad for russia because all of a sudden they don't got netflix and they don't got like all the other stuff that we <laughs> Fa do which facebook, is like really facebook awesome good fuck it i might move to russia facebook is banned yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah. So then, like, uh, I'll, I'll be really interested to hear about what you guys uh, have to say about uh, the decentralized internet. Is it good? Is it bad? Like, was it? What does it actually mean? I wait. I want. I want to first uh, do, do like a uh, like a bit of a rebuttal to the. Um, uh, well, I guess to your rebuttal to my to my idea of like in, increasing the events. I, I understand this idea of uh, like in classical in classical in the classical security dilemma. What you're describing is true. That uh, better defenses do imply a better offense. Uh, we, we see that, for example, in mutually assured destruction. If a country in, in develops a way to intercept, uh, to reliably intercept ICBMs, they suddenly are no longer vulnerable to a uh, nuclear uh, first or second strike, and suddenly they can be the aggressor. They actually have a, a, a heads-up advantage over anyone else in the nuclear field. And uh, that and this, uh, what looks like just a defensive measure on paper, is actually an offensive measure in the in the power balance in the in the security dilemma. When it comes to hacking, um, it, it's a bit different. Like it's the the way the way cybersecurity uh, handles those questions is basically par paranoia is the underlying sentiment. You you have to assume that you're trying to uh, to develop systems in a way where the, the they can handle the most bad actors possible. There will always be flaws. There will always be um, like like Ezium said, even a perfect system will still have a human component that can be a vulnerability. Uh, but you try to minimize it as much as possible uh, by thinking of like all the possible things that bad actors can do. Uh, so wh when it comes to like what I was saying about the, or what I was prescribing, having having companies strengthen their their cybersecurity through, for example, legislation forcing them to enact. Proper, uh, proper auditing, proper industry standards, and and uh, and like pub publicly submitting to those uh, to those regulations uh, is something that will um, sure it it will not stop a determined effort by like the Russian government. If the Russian government wants to hack them, they will still be vulnerable. But um, even then, you have to go into the cost of those attacks. Uh, something like Stuxnet is extremely expensive, not just in raw money and and the manpower needed to. Uh, develop it as uh, such a sophisticated attack. It's also an opportunity cost. Those four zero-day vulnerabilities that were invested in Stuxnet, they can never be reused for any kind of uh, operation on that level against against such a high-profile target. You need to find other vulnerabilities to use in in further operations. You burn them literally. Uh, as such, when when lower importance targets increase their security, they actually are safer. Okay. Yeah, I find that interesting because of the fact that you say like we need to have like companies with like higher higher standards and that kind of stuff because to basically to to when it comes to like these countries, these massive countries that can attack and that kind of stuff, there's no defense in that sense. But when we have like private hackers and that kind of stuff, that might be like useful because of the fact that you say like well they need to invest like you know a lot of time, money, whatever you know. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think that's one interest, and I think also when technology moves along, right, you will you will have like more complexer stuff and that kind of shit. So that being said, like I think this this uh, child, like you were mentioning this arms race, right, when it comes to cybersecurity, I think that will keep on happening because of the fact that if if you don't keep up with that arms race, uh, then you make yourself more uh, vulnerable to even like these private uh, hackers. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw down my completely unjustified personal take on this. I don't <laughs> think there is any parity in the hacking sphere. I think America has showed that it is the predominant hacker in the world. Its cyber technology is 
always been ahead of everyone else around the world. And I don't see that changing anytime soon. And if that did change, we would see an actual drive to have international standards around hacking. And as long as we don't, I think that signals that America comfortably feels that it is leagues ahead of everyone else when it comes to the hacking capabilities. So like the idea that this is analogous to a Cold War, um, to some degree holds true, but I don't think anyone um, is close. I don't think anyone, if it gets into it, is going to be able to compete in the hacking capabilities that the NSA like currently has and deploys. Um, and I think we've demonstrated this. We, we might not be as public as China in our automation processing yet. Um, who knows? Because that is like a black box that we don't talk about. We don't talk about any of our hacking. But our ability to gather data has already been shown to be insanely... Um, uh, I forget the word, but like insanely capable um, to capture every piece of data in foreign countries that we're like in conflict with and um, copy it is something that we've like unofficially disclosed we are capable of doing in Iran and previously in China um, and in Iraq and stuff like that. And like the security net that we threw over the entire Middle East during the war on terror is like an insane feat to think about of a foreign nation having better access to other nations information and data than that nation does of its own um it's it's all i don't know i don't i don't feel like there is a level playing field and if there was america would be reacting differently yeah so this kind of yeah. does suggest is that well we Bad actors do exist. America is the top dog, and America is going to be the one uh, who will leverage it in, for their own interest. Uh, kind of suggests to me that like there is going to be a a an arms race, but maybe on like one side of well, other countries want to uh, heavily invest in this in order to uh, either like counter America or um, or like even even attack America if if they so wanted to, um, mm -hmm. which like. Which kind of leads me to believe is that like every single time when I think about the security dilemma and it, it, it seems to be that most people want to feed into it because it's a positive feedback loop. And like the the, the knee-jerk reaction to do so is what is the problem in my opinion. Like I always, I always kind of default to, well, have we ever considered like some sort of a detente? Like during the Cold War, we were able to normalize relationships to the point where we, we didn't just like each uh respectively increase our own our own stockpile of nuclear arms to the point where we could destroy the world a couple times more and then within the next 10 years it's like okay well we, we now doubled it so uh we're not gonna we mm -hmm. now have the capabilities of destroying the, the world more uh more a couple times more and and so then like when it comes to like cybersecurity, if the united states doesn't have an interest to like pursue some sort of detente because well there's just like leaks ahead then to, to me the outcome is well other countries are going to try their best in order to uh, get onto the same level playing field and that's bad because i don't know like are we assuming that they're not going to do so um are, are we assuming that like they're going to be bad forever like if that's the case then um then would we want to like E even be more incentivized to make sure that they don't get on a le level playing field like that's uh, yeah there oh, are geez. a lot of incentives there but there's another component that's a really big problem is there's no way to enforce that de-escalation so like uh, ironically one of the benefits of nuclear stockpiles and is that it's like so visible it has such um a maintenance cost and it is so um you can have foreign investigators come and check up on each other. like during the cold war russian and american um we, we we form joint groups that can go and can investigate the nuclear stockpiles of each country to confer if the treaty is being upheld and there isn't like an analogous situation that you can really do when it comes to cyber attacks because these can just exist on any computer anywhere be developed on any computer anywhere um there's no way to actually ensure that even if some super awesome agreement is made, that anyone is actually holding to it. Yeah, so then um, I guess what I suggested before, in which uh, people did not talk about it, and I'm interested in what you guys have to say about it, 
which is uh, the decentralized internet. I, I don't know what that means in relation to this or how it would matter. Uh, well, do you at least know about like what Russia says they're going to do with the internet? Like they cut themselves off from the world. Internet. I mean, you can create firewall yourself, but like the internet is still the internet. It connects computers through protocols and that's still always going to be hackable. I don't, I don't know what that, yeah. I, you could you could isolate. Uh, you, you could go even further than the firewall. You could isolate the the entire network of your country and create a parallel, separate network specific to your country, and uh, everything that will run on that network will be basically air gapped from the rest of the internet. Yeah, but that doesn't would... protect you from hacking. That just means someone has to get within your network to hack. <laughs> Yeah, any, anyone who has physical access to your parallel network will still be obviously able to run attacks, but it goes back to, the, to how security works in, in the cyberspace is that making attacks more difficult is also, is also a part of a viable uh, security strategy. Uh, it, would be, it would be at a huge cost to the freedoms of the people. They would no, no longer be free to access the, uh, the rest of the internet. But it would add another layer of complexity to, to an attack. I mean, you it would wouldn't even the... be the freedoms of your people. You'd be kneecapping your entire industrial sector. A big part of it would be relying on, uh, on information outside. Though, to be fair, there, there is uh, something interesting. When you look at the internet, for example, in Russia or China or India, those huge, huge countries, they have developed their own internets even though it's all connected it's all accessible to anyone uh, whether it's the culture barrier or the language barrier um mm -hmm. it me it makes that it 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 it's visible that they be basically developed in parallel um so for example in the in the it world when when, when i when i lived in china i worked on chinese technology on uh, i was working on wechat wechat mini apps the documentation didn't exist in English. I, I was literally in Google Chrome, like Google translating the pages of documentation to be able to do anything. Uh, I, I, I once lost like two days of work on, on not being able to, to like resolve a problem with, uh, because the Google Translate was like bad. Um, <laughs> but the vice, so like the vice versa exists too. Like Chinese developers, they don't use uh, Western code libraries, or when they do, they only use them if, the, if someone's translated the Chinese documentation. And they'll usually actually fork the project and have like a Chinese-owned fork of the, of the original project that they'll run in their own, in their, like, own software development community rather than using the, the, the like, Western code base. Uh, I, I, uh, what I understand is Russia is very similar. They have like their own social media as well. They, uh, all those things have already developed in parallel, which means that the, uh, a lot of the industries and the markets already work only within the scope of those societies. So being, uh, obviously there, there, will so, there would still be great losses from cutting yourself off entirely from like physically from the rest of the internet. Uh, but a lot of things would still just continue to work the same way they, they have worked for the past 10 years. Yeah. So the, the general question from Chao was that if you have like this uh, parallel internet or decentralized internet, would that be effective against like hacking attempts? Well, it would stop. Uh, it would stop the most civilian hacking attempts, like uh, or foreign civilian at hacking yeah. attempts. I, I'm I'm trying to hack. Uh, I'm trying to like fish people in 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 Russia to get access to their Bitcoin account. I can't. Now I can't. I I need to physically go into Russia or have someone in Russia with a mail server uh, that I like fucking call and they they like set up the phishing attack for me etc cetera, etc cetera. it's like the like i said it's the level of complexity of, of attacks increases for governments it would be very easy to get to go over it all they need is an agent on the ground that they can communicate with uh through the normal internet or through normal communication means and and they and that agent will be able to uh then release the attack into the parallel internet uh without any issues awesome. but, espionage uh, yeah espionage yeah which obviously is within means of, of government agencies. That that's like not a big big uh, hassle for them. But for like a hacker group, for say like earlier or, or earlier, like the Russian hacking group that's been uh, uh, pushing ransomware into hospital computers and stuff like that, they wouldn't be able to uh, to do it if the U.S. internet was air gapped. 
they, they would need someone physically in the US to, to continue doing it. So I, don't... I, I just want to ask the uh, clarifying question, like uh, uh, going into our next sponsor, VPN Express. No, just kidding. But <laughs> are VPNs, are those, uh, are, are those effective to, to get into that network or is that not, you need to be physically there as well, or is like a VPN enough to, because then I don't think there is like a, a lot of difference, right? If that was well, it, it depends what we're talking about, right? So uh, if we're talking about like a China style internet with, with a firewall, uh, then you don't like we, I have access to Chinese servers, like from here, we, I can go mm -hmm. and go on any Chinese web page. I can look at any Chinese, uh, server, like access their IP addresses, et cetera. That, that's not an issue. Uh, and if I'm inside China, then I need a VPN to access like sites that are blocked by the firewall. Uh, it's more from like going in from, in from inside to outside that you need the VPN when it's a firewall situation. And if it's a physical uh, like air gap situation where the internet is actually physically cut off, then the VPN doesn't do anything because okay. the VPN is a, is a, is the VPN is literally a, a tunnel through the internet that then yeah. pops out of a server elsewhere. I, I don't it. think it's realistic that any country is ever going to completely cut off its internet from the rest of the world. In, in a scenario like this, like even China is not this extreme. Um, why? Why? Uh, the the feat of cutting off all of your infrastructure and rebuilding it would be quite massive. It would be detrimental to all of your information um, that all of your companies are going to rely on to, to be able to interact with anything outside of your country. It would be um, an incredible detriment to any industrial progress that you want to make. It, well, Russia's like, already getting be sanctioned crazy. to hell. It's already getting cut yeah, off. Yeah, but the you're world. you're talking about like embargoing yourself. You're not just talking about some sanctions. You're talking about cutting yourself off from like all outside trade information. That that's gonna your your country is gonna run days behind the rest of the world in its access to information. And and corporations are never going to be able to be competitive or um integrated with the rest of the world systems in, in a global economy in that situation. Well, Russia doesn't need to be competitive with the rest of the world if it just doesn't have any access to any of the world's markets. It has to be competitive I mean, with sure, itself. If, if a country wants to wall itself off and exist on its own, it could do it, but literally no one's going to want to do that. Like, and it, to be about, fair, like if I, we're I, talking I, about Russia, it, Russia would end up cutting itself off from all the non-aligned nations as well. Uh, they would cut themselves off from like India. Uh, how how would India be able to communicate with like how would Indian companies be then able to communicate with Russian companies, etc.? They're gonna make uh, a sorry, Russian sorry. friendly internet. <laughs> yeah, but then the, that's a huge infrastructure cost. Like they need to, they, you know, like they need to put up all the infrastructure once again that's been laid up over the la the past like fifty years. Put up the the like. Um, Underwater, underwater optic fiber stuff. You know what, uh, the, the only countries. charitable way is you'd have to do like you could make an internet too and have it be all done by satellites. And I don't know, yeah, you could like maybe do a circumvent some of the stuff, but like you're still talking about like insane costs for very little benefit because anything you make that's robust enough to be useful to the global modern economy is accessible enough to be just as vulnerable to hacking. <laughs> Yeah, so when they talk about like Russia, Russia saying like we're gonna cut ourselves off, it's more like the the firewall approach that China already does. That's probably what they are going for, right? Yeah, uh, they're they're more talking about like yeah, making uh more like what name was talking about having like Russian centric um circles of the internet that don't interact as much with the outside world, but it's not like inaccessible. Okay. Okay, that was interesting. I think we covered uh, a lot of stuff, but are there specific things that you guys still want to cover? Yes. yes I have one question well. that I'm super curious about that we haven't okay. gotten to. Um, so it seems to me at the start of the Russian-Ukrainian war that Russia specifically did not engage in cyber attacks against Ukraine. Um, curious if you guys agree or what you think the reasoning for that was. Wait, uh, are you saying they did not? Did yeah, not. I thought they did. Yeah, I, I, I read reports that they did. That they, uh, they were that taking there was, down government uh, websites. They were targeting banks. Yeah, exactly. This was like um, weeks okay. before the be... invasion. 
Okay. I could be uninformed as to the scale of it, but I... Hmm. Okay. So you guys feel like there was a, a cyber offensive? Yeah. And I'm pretty sure Russia obviously denied their involvement. Um, and what Naaman also mentioned before, uh, which is what Russia did, is that it was in like some different language or it was trying to like uh, frame it in false some flag. other. Yeah, it was a false flag. Not Well, not a false flag, um, but they were trying to falsify who was responsible for it by like putting out a, a message in a different language um i, I forget which one but I'll, I'll the narrative is that yeah russia it, this is obviously russia and i guess like feeding into that narrative is everybody was saying oh before russia actually invades they're going to start with a cyber attack they've done that before and so they're probably going to do it like that that was one of the signs that they were going to invade um or preparing to uh which they subsequently did Okay, mm. later on, if you guys could hit me up with any, no, I, 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 I think like any. I want to just say, like, maybe uh, because this is the difference, maybe they targeted like uh, companies uh, instead of the government. So maybe no, they also that's targeted the, the government. Yeah. Okay. They also targeted yeah, the government. Yeah, right that's, well. yeah, okay. Because that's if that was the case that they just targeted like companies, I could see that, they, that Elysium had some other, but yeah, Elysium. Oh, well, I I guess I'm not very aware of them. Uh, I'd be curious how to hear about them later because I feel like they like avoided bringing the conflict into that area specifically so that their businesses wouldn't be as targeted in something that we're seeing right now. So you make that you kind of make the assumption that if they did do that and if they weren't doing that, right? Uh, mm -hmm. If the, that that they would get some. Um, some pushback from from us uh, like some um, us cyber attacks like what because the, there is yes. some implication yeah and, well i don't think that because of the fact that they are not aligned you train but yeah whatever um you wouldn't get uh, like an official but you would you would get the green light for the us to do its own um plausible deniability attacks I mean, back. elysium is basically mm -hmm. saying that okay this this gives the United States the reason of, oh, we're going to react proportionally to what you did. Yeah, mm -hmm. but Elysium is also saying, like, because he thought that they didn't, mm -hmm. he thought that because of that, that the U.S. was that overarching super, uh, superpower when it comes to cybersecurity, and that's why they didn't do that. That's what Elysium did. Well, they wouldn't was... want to bring that into that sphere, yeah. Yes, exactly. Well, they were targeting Ukraine. Uh, they didn't. They weren't targeting the United States, and they yes, have they have targeted the United States before too, the election meddling. Um, I, I don't the um, the DNC attack was that Assange or was that Russia? Well, it technically Assange. Assange uh, so so technically Assange is the one who released the emails, uh, but the, what what Assange does is he receives uh, like anonymous tips and then just d dumps the data. So mm -hmm. but it's we, assumed we, to be Russia. Yeah. yeah, it's assumed to be Russian hackers, yeah. It's always the Russians. We don't know, though. Yeah, and then, yeah, like, I, I, Anonymous, I... like, the private hacking group, they've, they've been the ones targeting uh, also Russian companies, as well as uh, even, like, United States companies that aren't pulling operations out from Russia. I also saw that threat. Uh, yeah, so, Elysium, sorry, you wanted to respond? No, sorry, could you say that again? I didn't quite catch it. Okay, so um, An Anonymous, the private hacking group, they've been targeting Russian companies as well as uh, even threatening United States-based companies because they're not pulling out from, they're not pulling their operations yeah. from Russia. Mm -hmm. like, so it, it just feels like, 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 even if, even like under the belief that Russia didn't do any cyber attacks against Ukraine. Uh, there are actors doing cyber attacks against Russia. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, I did have I one what, uh, interesting yeah, thing I, to bring up. Yeah, I was thinking, but yeah, I forgot my point, but job go ahead. Oh, yeah. awesome. Yeah, perfect. Uh, so in the beginning, Zelensky came out uh, saying that like, if there are any civilians that wanted to join like our hacking operations, you can do so. Like he gave out that invitation uh, to the like in, to the entire world. I I, I want to say, 
um, in order to like defend or fight against against Russia. Um, this is kind of like I don't know if this is like unprecedented where a government is like, yeah, private citizens, uh, join my cause and and, and whatnot. Um, one, I don't know if it's unprecedented. And two, I want to know if you guys, like, are you guys worried about that? Is this a bad precedent? Um, is this is this something that we actually shouldn't be doing or, like, uh, uh, applauding for? Because uh, there's also a risk, I think, about of, well, uh, what if Russians wanted to use this channel in order to get inside of Ukrainian operations? Uh, kind of like, oh, oh, no. No, I'm not going to say that. That's going to get me in trouble. <laughs> yeah, so I know for a fact that it, like the, the US, like they hold like conferences when it's when it's talked about like uh, white hack conferences and that kind of stuff. And then, um, or they have like a, pref a presence on those sort of types of conference. And then they scout people and they scout people from all of the world. So uh, yeah, I think, I think being said like, to to fight foreign wars, uh, to have like a uh, like a, what you call it a war uh, an army that you can join a foreign legion, right? That kind of stuff you can make all those decisions. But uh, I'm genuinely I wouldn't advocate to even engage now if on a personal level. But yeah, if you uh, if if you want to be become an employee from for another country to do certain stuff, like yeah, sure, whatever, you know. But um, yeah, I don't know. What do you guys think? Like, name? What do you think? Um, yeah, I, I guess it is basically like a hacker foreign legion. Uh, there is definitely a con an operational security concern. Uh, in like, obviously, it's going to be easier to infiltrate that kind of uh, an organization yeah. that's opening its arms to to anyone who wants to help. Um, I'm going to assume that they know what they're doing. That they're they're not like opening up their servers to any rando who just signed up that they're rather like maybe telling them to do things and seeing if they're capable of doing them and um like let it like rather using people than than letting those people gain access to privileged information uh at least that's how i would think about it uh, if i was in their shoes I would try to look at the objectives and tasks that I can give out to people that don't that uh, cannot compromise anything uh, on, on my end, mm -hmm. and hope they accomplish them with their own resources. I wouldn't be giving resources out to, to random people either. Uh, but I, I don't know. I don't know what the reality uh, of their of their program is. Like how how they organize it. Uh, as for diplomatically, it's uh, it does it does have like um, an escalation aspect. But to be fair, there like you talked about foreign legion. There, there, there is ample precedent historically of countries, um, whether it's uh, it's in domestic like civil war situations or in outright war with a foreign country. There's ample precedent of countries receiving uh, support from and calling for like foreign individuals to to come help. So uh, I, I don't know. I, it's it, yeah, it's like the same as a foreign legion at that point, really. Mm -hmm. Okay, a legion. Yeah, I think getting public support or public um, aid from other countries, even this stuff is like has a lot of precedent. I don't think it has as much precedent within like um, cyber attacks or, or cyber security. No, but, that's that's um, that's even yeah. older. That's even older than uh, like uh, just normal foreign agents. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good. <laughs> like, of course. Uh, Sorry. Yeah, but I, I I do think this is a novel moment, like the first time that a country has called for other people to openly like just come and help hack another country for sure. Um, and I don't actually think oh, it's sorry, a good sorry. Go. Well, uh, I, I what you said it just remind me. I we could maybe make an argument that the the first instance of something like this happening was um uh, the the Pol Polish mathematicians and refugees from World War II in the UK who helped develop the Enigma project. They were hackers. They they broke uh, Nazi German cryptography uh, using cal like calculating machines in order to uh, advance to further. Hold on, they like, were allies. Like, Come on, they weren't yeah. military. They were civilians. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They were civilians who yeah, were, but it was like got, from uh, allied countries. It, 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 okay. Yes, yes. I, I know this because of the this this fucking movie. Uh, what is it called? 
it's probably called oh, Enigma. The, the imitation game? It's, yeah, it's, imitation yeah, it's game, an yeah. imitation game. <laughs> yeah, it was like contracted. <laughs> it was okay. contracted with the military, if anything. That, that was the UK site. Never mind. Don't worry about it. Yep. Yeah, that's true. Um, I think there is a distinct difference. I, I, I could agree that that could be like the first like civilian hacking. I mean, yeah, um, that'd be pretty funny. Um, but I think there's a difference between like a government led organization or like government led effort that's in conjunction with that they have like like some oversight and control over and the like very loose um civilians doing what they deem to be appropriate where you don't have very much control over how it could escalate or what targets um or what people target or what people think is the correct thing to do um that's kind of where i get the more negative view of such a call um of just it being too broad too escalatory and too prone um, to how fucking stupid people are. <laughs> yeah, w one one thing to go in that direction as well. Like uh, you can very easily see people successfully execute a hack and handle the results of the hack in an irresponsible or poor manner. Uh, I, I was I was just reading an article about um, a, U a Ukrainian hacker who had the, actually had an in on uh, on the on like a russian group's um communications they they had managed to uh to like basically have access to their computers or their communications and that that hacker in question uh, had been uh working as a whistleblower basically for years they'd been um just giving out info to law enforcement whenever there was uh, criminal activity etc uh but because of the invasion they like got really pissed and they just started dumping all, all of their data and uh, the FBI contacted them and asked them to stop because they are more of more value when the when the hackers don't know that they've been compromised than when all with all this data just being dumped out in the, into the public <laughs> yeah okay uh, Chad does that answer your question yeah it, it kind of does um Elysium did mention that this was unprecedented but he he didn't really give out like his thoughts or maybe just fence sitting no, I think it's unprecedented in the lack of oversight that government has over that call. And I think that's bad. Okay, you think like that's bad? There's a, a strict negative, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's a bad precedent of, like, if a country is engaged in a um, um, bad action, we'll just say, that, like, it's a green light for any civilian around the world to start, you know, engaging in hostile actions towards them. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. And that being said, the, the first hacking attempt was the Trojan horse it, itself, you know? True. Uh, <laughs> Troy, well, yeah, the first yeah. hack. Yeah. Okay. The Trojan horse or social engineering to the max, you know? So, <laughs> Is that why go. it's called a Trojan uh, horse? The virus? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So, uh, yeah. Uh, that being said, like, name, do you still, uh, do you got anything else that you wanted to bring up? Not particularly, no. Uh, so I think we're done, unless it's at least you move Chow, uh, if you... I'm good. I'm okay. good as well. Then it's all right. I, I guess I just want a closing statement, if that's okay. Uh, uh, no, we uh, yeah, sure. No? So we're going to give everybody a closing statement. Yep. Let's start off with Nate. Okay. Uh, I want to just use my closing statement. If if anyone listening in is really in, uh, has gotten like more interested in the questions of uh, of privacy and security, I, I would just like to like to give out some pointers. The EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, is a nonprofit that um, that advocates for proper privacy for individuals and and their cyber rights, basically. I would like uh, I would like to point you in that direction. If you're more interested in um, in in your own security, then uh, um, I, I don't have actually like an exhaustive resource off the top of my head, but the EFF does actually provide guides for like which apps to use that have good encryption, uh, what what are the best practices as a as a consumer of of uh, the internet, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, I, I just want to like throw this out there if anyone's uh, interested in like upping their their cybersecurity game. Yeah, uh, that being said, we today we're being sponsored by <laughs> no, just kidding, <laughs> by your own security, you know. Uh, no, but uh, Elysium, go ahead. I don't know, I have a closing sign. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Chit chat. Yeah, Mr. Robot was a good show. Uh, it's what carried me throughout this conversation. That's all I know about hacking and whatnot. Mr. Robot, 
what a thriller. Uh, Should have gotten more seasons. <laughs> uh, but in all seriousness, this was a good conversation, very enlightening. Um, a lot of good insight from uh, two particularly two particular people or one cartoon and one person uh, on this panel. Uh, Chin and I are just we're we're floating here. We're floating here, but we keep our ears open. I'm still like a bit doomer pilled, and I definitely have this. Definitely does confirm my belief that governments are going to be like really really wary about each other as well as uh, private hacking. Uh, it's especially Russia now that like anonymous has come out and been like, yeah, we actually are capable of, of fucking you up. And then like, uh, even though Elysium believes that, uh, it's the United States, that's the top dog in cybersecurity, uh, popular culture suggests that it's, it's the Russians, you know, they're, they're really good at this stuff. And then for private, for like a private organization of citizens to just kind of like target them and make them vulnerable and hurt them um does suggest that damn yo private hackers kind of scary kind of scary but uh if i take naming's advice i'll be good i'll just keep myself poor and uh not a target 